Hello everyone and welcome. This is not a car, but it is made by a car company, Ford. And when you start to break it all down, well, it has a windshield, there's a cabin air filter, it's driven by an electric motor, and that electric motor is battery powered. So it's almost a Ford Mustang, right? Okay, not quite, but this is an extremely cool endeavor Ford has gone down in the fight against the coronavirus COVID-19. This is a powered air purifying respirator, or PAPR. The demand for these devices in medical facilities has surpassed the supply, and Ford saw this as an opportunity to lend their engineering towards a worthy cause and help temporarily boost supply by developing their own unit. The device you see here went from being an idea on a sheet of paper to a production unit in just 38 days. That's incredibly fast. This plastic housing design did not exist prior. The tooling for the housing didn't exist prior, and yet here I am holding something that engineers put together from start to finish in about a month, the same duration it takes me to respond to emails. Now when I heard about this project, it reminded me of the story of Apollo 13, where engineers had to make a square filter fit in a circular hole, using the supplies laid out in front of them, representing what the astronauts had access to use. I even told my wife about it. Hey, this is like that Apollo 13 scene, only to find out later that day Ford has called this Project Apollo. So what's a PAPR and how did Ford make one so quickly? A PAPR is a device worn to protect the wearer from airborne particulate matter. In the case of medical workers, personnel can wear the device to dramatically reduce the likelihood of catching the coronavirus or any other dangerous viruses, bacteria, or particulates floating around in the air while treating patients. The basics of how it works, a battery sends power to a motor, that motor spins a fan which forces air into the hood of the wearer. The air comes in through the back of the unit, passes through a filter, then up a hose and into the hood. It maintains a high enough airflow that it builds a very slight pressure in the head covering so that you don't have any of the surrounding air work its way inside of the mask. It must pass through the intake on the back of the device. This device was a collaboration between Ford and 3M and their various supply partners. 3M handled the hood and connecting hose, while Ford handled the air pump, filter, electronics, and housing. Running through the various parts is a fascinating story. Remember, time is the most critical thing here. It needs to be made as quickly as possible. Here's Ford's engineering team discussing the urgency and challenge. We had to develop, design something from scratch that we had never done before. We didn't have the specifications. We didn't understand the use case. And we had to put this design together with very limited time and we didn't have a lot of opportunity to redo things if we had issues. So basically, do it once and do it right. Now, just to be clear, the unit I have access to is one of the early prototypes, which was used to test and validate the design and manufacturing process. No worries, I'm not holding this from healthcare workers, as this unit was never built to be sent to customers. You can think of it as an automotive equivalent to an early stage prototype vehicle or test mule. As I mentioned, the housing was designed by Ford, initially created using a 3D printer to test the layout. Ford's human machine interface team stepped in to lend their ergonomics expertise, and wearing it, it fits the shape of my back surprisingly well, with a design that's intended to accommodate the common range that automotive interiors are also optimized for, from the 5th percentile female to the 95th percentile male. This entire project started as an idea on March 19th, and you can see this test unit is marked April 14th, less than a month later. And this is the early production injection molded housing that's come back from their supply partner. Inside the unit, you'll find a battery. This is straight off the shelves at Home Depot, making access to additional batteries and chargers easy, regardless of where the units are sent. There are two different sized DeWalt batteries that can be used, giving the unit a total runtime of four to six hours with a standard capacity battery, or eight to 10 hours with the high capacity battery. A simple switch turns the unit on and off, with a control panel regulating the fan's airflow. You then have the fan and filter. Air is pulled through ports on the sides and bottom, passes through a newly designed air filter, through the fan, and up to the hood. This fan is very similar to the air conditioning seat fans used in the Ford F-150, selected for its efficiency and low noise. You can see the F-150's part number labeled on the original sketch, as well as specifying the pull-through system. Pulling air through a filter, or radiator in the case of cars, rather than pushing it through, tends to be more efficient and can offer lower noise. They ended up using a more powerful fan than what's used in the F-150, but the overall design is quite similar. As for the filter, I never thought I'd be so fascinated by something so seemingly simple. 
Ford first looked at their automotive style filters, but the requirements are a bit different for medical grade filters. Initially, the plan was to use 3M for supplying the filter, but 3M's filter production demand was already too high, so Ford had to end up designing the filter themselves. Ford worked with the German supply partner, Mann & Hummel, to manufacture the filter. Now here's where things get fascinating. You've probably heard the term N95 referring to masks used in medical facilities. The 95 means these masks block at least 95% of all particulate matter passing through them. So when the masks are tested, 0.3 micron particles are used. A 95% efficiency means if 10,000 particles were to attempt to pass through, the mask will trap 9,500 of them. A HEPA filter, like the one used in Ford's respirator, has a 99.97% efficiency, meaning if 10,000 particles are sent at it, the mask will trap at least 9,997 of them. Nearly all. Now, you'd reasonably think, wait a minute, we're still allowing up to three particles through? Surely that's enough to get someone sick, right? Well, this testing is looking at absolute worst case. Testing is conducted using particles of 0.3 micron diameter. This is known as the most penetrating particle size, MPPS. In other words, it's the absolute toughest particle to capture. And using the absolute toughest particle to capture, these filters are capable of stopping 99.97% of them. If the particle is bigger or smaller, the chances of the particle getting through dramatically decrease. Now, wait a minute. How in the world is a filter more effective at removing particles that are even smaller than 0.3 micron? Let's have a quick simplified example. On the right, we have a HEPA filter pulling in air. On the left, we have a bacteria cell, 1 micron in diameter. We have an MPPS particle at 0.3 micron in diameter. And we have a single coronavirus particle at 0.125 micron in diameter. The 1 micron particle is simply too large to pass through the filter, so it gets trapped. But our little coronavirus fits just fine. Surely it will make it. The problem with particles of this size is that they have extremely low mass. The low mass means their flight path is super irregular. This is because as they move through the air, they bump into gas molecules, making their path chaotic and irregular. This is known as Brownian movement. If the particle could fly straight, it'd have a much better chance of making it through the filter. But the zigzag flight means there's a super high probability it ends up bumping into filter fibers and getting caught. There's a sweet spot around 0.3 micron where the particulate has enough mass to fly straight and it's small enough to pass through the filter media that it has the highest probability of getting through. But remember, even at this perfect size, that probability of making it through is just 0.03% or less. All of this is to say that this filter is extremely good at preventing whoever is wearing it from catching something that might be floating around in the air around them, which is obviously critically important for healthcare workers treating patients with coronavirus. Now, if you look at the design, you'll see the filter is held in by 10 screws. This isn't a quickly swappable item, and that's intentional. It's designed so that it's not easy to remove. It even uses torque screws less common than Phillips head. This is because the assembly is essentially meant to be permanent. The seal of the filter is critically important. The entire design could be jeopardized if a new filter were to be installed incorrectly. So the hospitals have to buy new peppers every time the filter is toast? Not exactly. As you can imagine, hospital air quality is actually quite good from the constant internal filtering that's already occurring. This filter is designed to last the life of the device, never needing to be changed out. Part of this is because these devices have approval for limited use, while traditional peppers are simply out of stock. They are only to be used during the COVID-19 emergency, as approved by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. This NIOSH approval ensures the device meets industry standards. Aside from the HEPA filtration, it has to maintain an airflow of 6 cubic feet per minute. Before using the device, the wearer will use a supplied airflow meter to ensure it is supplying proper airflow. This is critical so that no particulates will enter the hood as it supplies positive pressure. The device also has to maintain noise levels below 80 decibels, as measured from inside the hood. I was expecting this to be a terrible experience to wear because of the noise, but it's surprisingly quiet. I measured the noise consistently below 60 decibels inside the face mask, significantly quieter than the inside of most modern car cabins cruising on the highway. You looked under my hood? Now, this test unit does not have the belt strap that will be provided, so I'm using my own belt. 
but again, it's surprisingly comfortable on my back and doesn't weigh much. I measured the weight of this entire kit, hood, battery, filter, and all, including my belt, at 7 pounds. The devices are also sold at wholesale price of $700 a piece, which is significantly less than what I saw many different variants selling for at retail, and many of these aren't expected to be back in stock for up to three months. Also, if Ford does turn any profit from the production of these respirators, of which they are obviously paying their parts suppliers, as well as paying the 90 UAW volunteers who've chosen to make them, any profits that do come in from this will be sent to charities seeking to help those impacted by COVID-19. The first shipment went out in early May to Virginia Mason Hospital in Seattle, Washington. Ford has produced over 10,000 units so far, with the capacity to make over 100,000 if needed. This among the other forms of PPE Ford is producing, such as face shields or reusable gowns. They're producing reusable gowns at a rate of 200,000 per week, with states like New Jersey having placed orders for 500,000 gowns from Ford. Hospitals, companies, and agencies can place orders at ppe.ford.com. All in all, a super impressive engineering feat and effort by Ford and its suppliers. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.